Everybody, this is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal. If you're signing on, we see the numbers ticking in. We're going to wait a little bit till we have everybody on, and then we'll get started with tonight's webinar, today's webinar. I'm just trying to get this live on Facebook. It might actually be on my page instead of the Sound Journal page, but we'll get that fixed. All right. Happy Tuesday, everybody. This is Lars Light from the Psalm Journal. I welcome you to our latest webinar. Uh, I'm here with Adrian Bridge, President and CEO, CEO of the Flaggate Partnership. I need to just uh, silence my other. CEO of the Flaggate Partnership. Sorry about that. Little technical challenge here. There we go. Uh, so, Adrian, this is a, a sort of a very exciting time. Obviously, your company is known for its wonderful port wines, uh, but you are now getting into table wines uh, with some very interesting entries that we're going to talk about tonight. Some people who are fortunate enough to um, register in time with the uh, with the uh, Psalm Foundation will, will be able to taste at least two of them with us tonight. But uh, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you for your hospitality, by the way. This weekend, I had the opportunity to visit uh, in Oporto and uh, see the world of wine, uh, have the wine experience. Uh, if I highly recommend if anybody gets the chance to be in Portugal uh, to head over to um, to what you're, what you're doing over there. So thank you for that and look forward to trying these wines again and hearing more about them. Okay, great. Well, Lars, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation and, and everyone. It's a delight to be uh, online uh, with you, uh, having a chance to share some, some uh, of our table wines. I've actually got four wines in front of me. I think some of you have got two. So we're going to talk about all four. I'm joining you from the uh, Quinta de Fagelas. So this is our port property right over on towards the eastern side of the Douro, where harvest is pretty much finished. We've got about another day's worth of picking to do here. And you know, it's been an exciting um, harvest in, in, in the Douro, certainly this year. Um, we've seen some outstanding wines made. And I have to say that in sort of 30 years of uh, being here at the harvest, this is probably uh, some of the finest young ports I've seen made. Wow. You would have also probably seen that uh, on the news uh, last week, there were a few fires in Portugal. There was there was quite a smoky haze that was taking place. I know last when you were here at the end of last week, it was still hanging around over the town of Porto. Uh, and about 30,000 hectares of uh, eucalyptus woods were burnt, uh, which put a big uh, smoke haze over um, the northern part of Portugal. I believe it also put a 100,000 kilometer smoke haze over the Atlantic Ocean, which uh, is considering Portugal is 93,000 kilometers, the size of Portugal sitting out over the Atlantic, covered in smoke because of these wildfires. Um, 
You're going to hear a little bit about that. I don't think there's any concern for us. Certainly here in the Dura, we had two days of haze, but but you really couldn't smell it. So there's no issues of smoke taint or anything like that. I didn't all... smell it. I understand that there was some uh, some rainfall helped kind of tamper it down. Yeah, so that, that was it. I mean, within the four days, the, the fires burned um, and they raged. Uh, but we were then followed by a, a fairly healthy dose of rain last Friday night um, here, which produced, um, put out all the fires, but it was 20 millimeters. So, you know, that would have started to affect the maturation. And, and really this week, um, you know, we're seeing people rushing to get in the last of the grapes from, from this year's harvest. And there's probably still at least a week, 10 days worth of picking to take place. Um, so, you know, I think the, you know, the overall feeling certainly in the Duro is this is going to be a super exciting year. Uh, we don't normally make predictions of whether we're going to make classic vintages or anything like that. But I have to say, um, in my 30 years of being up here, um, highly optimistic would be probably the best way to describe uh, how I'm feeling right now from some of the things that we've tasted. But we've also had a good harvest in, in a number of the table wine regions in which we are producing now. And I just want to give just a little bit of a, a background as to how the Flatgate Partnership got into the table wine business and why we got into the table wine business. And I think, you know, it, it, it's an important point because, you know, we've been effectively focused on port for the last 332 years. Um, and then suddenly we're popping up with table wines, not just from the Douro, uh, but also from a number of other regions around Portugal. And the logic for us has been that around the world in the last 20 years, we've seen strong growth in special category ports. That's your LBVs, your aged tawnies, your single quinta vintages, your vintage port, uh, some of the dry white ports, things like uh, the reserve rubies, the bin 27. You know, that nowadays accounts for about 25% of the volume of port, but over 50% of the value of the port industry. Uh, and to give you some context of that, 20 years ago, it was probably around 17% uh, of the volume and, and was somewhere in the region about 25% of the value. So there's been a huge increase over the last 20 years, whilst at the same time, the commodity end of the port business has declined. And that's led a number of our competitors, obviously, to get into the table wine business. We didn't because... Being the leading producer of special category ports, we need all of our grapes in order to get into uh, to make to make our ports. And you know the the reality, of course, is that the the expectation people would have with us entering into the table wine business that are we'd be making wines that would be scoring points in 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 the mid nineties um, at least. And of course, if you're going to try and do that in table wine, you need to use your best grapes. Then they're not available for port. So you know. There is no easy solution to that conundrum. What actually uh, we've seen around the world is increased uh, interest in Portuguese wines, and not least in the United States, where uh, it's being driven by tourism. So to give you a figure, uh, 10 years ago, there were about 30,000 Americans who came to visit on holiday in Portugal. Last year, that number was 2 million. This year, it's expected to be 2.2 million. Um, the number of Americans that came to actually live in Portugal last year was around about 15,000. So you can see that there's been a massive increase in people being interested in Portugal, wanting to come and live, wanting to come and visit. And after all, there's good reasons for that. It's, it's a beautiful country. It, it's relatively small. Um, it's got a huge variant of landscapes from, from here in the beautiful Douro Valley, but uh, but in the northern northern part of the Minho up on the Spanish border, in the city of Porto, the city of Lisbon, and in the wild plains of the Alentejo, where, where some fantastic wines are made as well. So a lot of variety. Um, everybody speaks English, which means it's easy to get around and communicate. Uh, we haven't upset anybody since about the 15th century. So it's a pretty safe and secure place to, to come to visit. And so lots of people are doing just that. And so, of course, they're interested Having tried Portuguese wines, they're very much interested in, in trying to buy them when they go home. And so that's been the reality. But uh, for us, you know, we focused just on, on the port and the special categories. Well, about a year ago, um, in the spring of um, 2023, uh, we were approached, uh, along with actually some other companies, uh, to by a gentleman who had built up a portfolio of outstanding Portuguese wines. Um, he'd originally made his money actually in the watch business. 
Um, it sold that business, got into Table Wine in about 2008, built some fantastic, uh, bought some businesses and, and built some businesses in terms of um, four different uh, regions of Portugal. So in the Alta Mingu, Baixa Mingu, the, the Down and the Bairada. And I've got, I've got a slide or two in a moment, which I'll just pull that up so we understand where these places are. But, but basically done that, um, wife and family living in Switzerland. He was here in Portugal um, and got to a point when he said, look, you know, my, I'm going to retire. Um, my daughter isn't interested in taking over the business. What am I going to do with it? Uh, he put it on the market. A number of people were interested because he's been making some outstanding wines. Um, we looked at the business and were super excited by the sheer quality uh, of what was being produced. Um, and in the end, you know, we purchased the business. Uh, to be absolutely fair, he, in fact, selected us to buy it, not because we had the best offer, but partly because uh, the business he had built was kind of focused just in Portugal. 97% of the sales have been in Portugal, and our business is 94% export. So he was really looking at that opportunity to internationalize these wines and really, um, you know, create his legacy. So, um, you know, we, as I say, by no means were the people offering the most price. And indeed, he's been extremely accommodating in, in helping us um, with this with this uh, purchase. Um, and has, you know, we bought the entire business. We've taken over all the teams uh, of people. So including the consultant winemaker, Pascal Chatonet, who some of you may know that name because Pascal has done a lot of work around the world here in here in Iberia with uh, with what was called Ideal Drinks, but um, but also with Vega Sicilia um, in, in Spain. So um, we bought the business. We took it over um, in August of last year in the middle of harvest. We've had one year to kind of sort things out a bit. It came with a lot of stock. So uh, the previous owner was fun, loved making uh, wines, um, spent a lot of money in, uh, in the vineyards and take, taking really good care. He wasn't really that interested in selling them. So we've ended up, for example, with a huge amount of stock. And that's why uh, when we get on to tasting something like the Calcario, um, it's the 2012. That's the current release. Um, and we have the 13, the 14, the 15 and so on to come. So um, super exciting, great quality wines. Now, what I'm going to do, because I am um, I know that and these sorts of things, we should probably get to a, a glass in the hand and, and taste something. Um, but what I also want to do is a quick share or screen that gives you a bit of the flavor of where these all are coming from. Can, is that showing fully or am I still got all these sidebars? We see the sidebars. We don't have your full screen. Does that improve it? Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, we're going to look at we'll look at a couple of different regions. Um, one is Alvarinho grapes, which are coming from the very north of Portugal on essentially the Spanish border, and then we're going to look at uh, Principal and an area called Bairada, um, which is about an hour and a half south of Porto. There's a lot of information on this page, and certainly, Lars, what I can do is share this presentation with you, so that if anybody else is is kind of interested. Uh, we can we can send it along. Um, but I'm gonna... if, if you're out there and you're looking for the presentation, just send me a note, Lars at somjournal.com by email. I'd be happy to send it along to you. So we've got a, um, a these are the winemakers, the the main winemakers, are Quinta de Pedro, dealing with the the Vino Verde region, the Alto Mingo, and then Principal. So we've got uh, Marcia Gonzalves, who also works with another winemaker we have called uh, Zé Maria Machado. And uh, Stefan Poing, who has joined us uh, or been in the business for um, a while and, and obviously has a, a, a long history um, as, a, as a Frenchman in, in, in wine. So what I'm going to try and do is just give you, these are the four we're going to have a look at, but I'm going to jump on here to just a picture of Portugal and try to focus on on what we've got. So this is the kind of story of, of how Portugal is, is graded. You've got the DOCs, the, the specific regions, you've got the reg regional wines, and then you've got the table wines. Now, the north here, Vina Verde, is one of the biggest areas of Portugal, um, and it encompasses 
a lot because, of course, the name Vino Verde conjures up with many people uh, the wines that were very early successful wines in Portugal. If we think of the sort of Macias and Lancers and so on, which were slightly sparkling, um, very successful after the Second World War. But the, the wines of this region now, um, you know, are very, very different. And I like to refer to this not so much as Vino Verde, but as the Mingu. And the Mingu is this region that has relatively good rainfall throughout the year, good sunshine, great soils. But if you're right on the north, it's about the Alvarino grape variety. If you're in lower down in the region where we have a vineyard called Paso de Palmeira, uh, that's about the Loreiro grape variety. If you are on the eastern side, um, right on the border of the Douro Valley, the grape variety there is Aveso, which is, which is a beautiful grape variety and, and one that um, that a lot of wine, not a lot of wines actually get exported outside Portugal of Aveso, but a sort of very interesting thing. We're going to focus on the on the Alvarino um, today, but going down a bit, you see there the, the sort of yellowy region, uh, the down, the down is interesting because it's in the interior. It's provide. It's the other side of a small mountain range around the Serra of Estrela. So it's very protected from any influence of the ocean. Um, it's typically high altitude. Um, it's got a cooler conditions in the summer. It's extremely good for great varieties like Trigue Nacional, Pinot Noir, um, and we also have some other um, varieties planted there. We've got a little bit of Cabernet Franc. We've got some. Um, a Sauvignon Blanc that we're making in, in that property. Neither the Pinot Noir nor the Sauvignon Blanc are destined for export markets, um, but, but nonetheless, that's what we do in, in that region. And then if we come a little further south, you go to the Bayrada, and the Bayrada, we've got the Calcario and, and Principal, two wines we're gonna look at today. Well, Bayrada is about an hour and 20 minutes directly due south of Porto, around the town of Coimbra, the old university town of Coimbra. Bayrada ha is about 20 kilometers from the ocean, um, very similar to kind of the Madop, which is about 30 kilometers from the ocean. So you've got that uh, influence of the ocean. In the vineyards we have there, they are basically on a clay limestone, which is an old seabed. Um, and if you look at our property, it, it kind of is a rather strange shape. It tends to follow almost like a snake across the landscape because it's literally following the outcrop of, of the limestone. So, and then we've got Lisbon further south there, and then various other regions of Portugal, including the Alentejo. Nice little map, Vina So here we are, gives you a sense of, of where we're talking. Let's just pop down. I don't, I don't know the extent to which we need to worry too much about when the region was established, um, but the typical Vino Verdes, which are on the coast, tend to get a little bit more of the sea influence. Our particular property is a little bit further uh, inland. And you can see it there. It's called Monsal. So the sub-region um, is Monsal Malgasso. And if I just scoot along here, we will look, there you are at a vineyard um, on the landscape there. So it's a, um, it overlooks uh, Spain, so we're literally right up on, on the border there. Alvarino grapes. And, and one of the things about um, this particular planting is that we've, in this particular vineyard, this vineyard, which is where we're making the grass of the Pedro, okay? This is around about 84 um, acres in size, converting from sort of 34 hectares, is about 80, 84, 85 um, acres. Um, typically here we have, uh, it's 100% it's planted with Alvarino. It's obviously got relatively high rainfall. And indeed, at this moment today, we've actually stopped harvest up there simply because of rain. So we've had a pause um, in, in the process of, of making it. Relatively dense um, planting of the vines. The reason for that, obviously, is to to try to um, you know to to ensure that we have got uh, through that density. We're ending up with the more concentrated fruit. Uh, we'll see that here. We'll see that down in the Bayrada region as well um, as as something that that is particular to the way that that, that we have planted. Um, the, the property, as I've described it, and the name of it 
which is key to the Pedro. Now, if I hold this up here, with, there's two wines that essentially we're going to taste from here. The first one is the um, Quinta de Pedra, but it's called Grasa de Pedra. And the second wine, which I don't think everybody's got, but nonetheless, um, I'm going to taste here, which is something called the Milagres. Milagres is the Portuguese word for a miracle. And a Grasa is a small miracle. So it gives you a little bit of the hierarchy immediately. Uh, that is to say that the Milagros is about a $28 uh, retail uh, bottle of uh, Alvarino, whereas the Brasa, we would expect a retail selling price in the United States of 17. Now, I'm giving you retail as an indexation. I'm sure from that you can probably work out what wholesale prices might be and indeed um, you know, what that might mean to you in, in your restaurants or hotels. Um, Thank but you it, for that easiest thing I can do is is the expected retail selling price. Now, this is this particular um, label, this particular wine um, is new. This is a, a change we made. The the previous version of this had been something called Longo Vals. I didn't particularly like Longo Vals as a name. It's, it's too generic. But I put, what I did particularly like is, is um, this image, this drawing that we've got here, which is a little chapel under this giant boulder of granite. Because this property called Quinta de Pedra has um, a huge outcrop of granite boulders. And the very top ones of those um, actually have got steps cut into them. And if you actually look at it from um, Google Earth, you can essentially see it's an old fortification. So it dominates the landscape behind around it. So you can see actually in the back of this picture, um, if you can see my mouse sort of moving, it's the stones are back here, um, forming um, a high point dominating the surrounding landscape. And this was an old Celtic settlement. Uh, these old granite uh, blocks have got steps cut into them. And interestingly, at the lower stone, the lower granite boulder has had this chapel built underneath it. The chapel was built in 1688. Um, the Catholic Church being particularly good normally at uh, um, taking advantage of uh, other religious sites for, for the purpose of, of building their particular churches and chapels. It's a very beautiful granite um, built uh, chapel with this distinctive red door built in um, 1688. And I thought that that was an appropriate uh, label for our Grass of the Pedra Alvarino. Now, some of you may, if we be familiar with uh, with the Alvarino grape, there's a great variety that, that reaches good maturity. I think, uh, Lars, uh, we were discussing on the weekend uh, the fact that the Alvarino grape has uh, more pips than most, most grape varieties um, in it. But um, if we can have a look at this wine, we can possibly get this up and just take a good look at the, you know, the cleanness of this. Um, the nice freshness. So this one is in fact the 2022 um, that we have, have just uh, recently uh, released. The fermentation of this, um, you know, we're bringing in the grapes, we're putting them in a cold room for um, 24 hours before then processing, this, processing them into the winery. Um, and the whole thing is done on, you know, in stainless steel uh, under temperature control. Um, and then they will stay um, you know, they will stay on their leaves for, for a bit before then being blended. The, the one that spends more time on the leaves, it would be the, the uh, Milagros, which is the 2019. So this is released as an older Alvarino. And there's a very much, there's a trend of, um, distinct trend of uh, Alvarinos of people releasing young, fresh, uh, ready to drink immediately and um, aged Alvarinos with with a little bit more complexity and structure from having more time on the leaves and a little bit more time um, in the bottle. Adrian, if I can just jump in for a second, just to, to clarify. So we're talking about Alvarino, A-L-V-A-R-I-N-H-O, as opposed to Alvarino. It's essentially the same grape that's migrated uh, from northern Spain. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm not sure the word migration is right. I mean, this is a region in you know northwest Spain, northwest Portugal are essentially the same climate, the same soil. There is an international boundary down the River Minho, 
which is forms the northern border of or the border between Spain and, and Portugal here. Um, the, the reality is it's the same grape variety grown on both sides of, of the river. Um, there's a little bit of difference between, I think, the um, approach to viticulture uh, in, in um, Spain versus Portugal. Um, there tends to be on the Spanish side um, a few uh, bigger properties, uh, whereas on the Portuguese side, it tends to still be dominated by a lot of smaller properties. Hence, it's unusual that we've got the kind of 84 um, acre property, which, which is a reasonable uh, single size to, to, to be dealing with. But it's the same grape variety um, and, and it's, the, it's this, the same approach on, on both sides to, um, to normally to the, you know, the vinification and so on. In Spain, you tend to find a lot of the Albarinos, um, you know, are drunk in the domestic Spanish market. And so probably Albarino is something you come across more from Spain than you get Albarinos from Portugal, simply because um, it has been more popular with consumers uh, over there who tend to drink it with their tapas if they're not having, um, you know, a fino sherry or something. So because you're looking for that lovely, fresh, clean um, note. This subregion, Monsal Mugasso, is considered the finest region in the sense that it is further in uh, inland and further away from the Atlantic Ocean, and so therefore tends to have uh, less influence from the sea. We have less issues with humidity. This is a region which you know can uh, sometimes have problems with um, uh, with uh, mildew, and indeed last year when we bought. Uh, this property, there was a mildew problem. So the harvest of 2023 was relatively small, um, but happy to say this year, um, in fact, the, the harvest is going well and, and the crop size is usual um, and is a usual size for us. But remember, the Alvarino grape, particularly planted the density that we've got it planted, can produce um, up to about 10 to 12 um, uh, tons per, per hectare. Um, so it can be relatively uh, high yielding um, as a great variety. And, right. and you know, eight to 10 tons on a property like this would be fine. Uh, this year, we're a little bit lower than that, but but that's where we would expect to get to um, when these vines are, you know, um, in, in, in full production. As I say, last year, we had a problem of, um, of mildew. You know, we would consider mildew is, is a little bit of um, a disease of neglect, uh, sometimes just be unlucky. Uh, what we think happened in 2023 is because the business was being sold, um, there was just a little less focus on it and, and you only need to miss it uh, for a couple of days and get your treatments uh, a couple of days out and then you can suddenly have a problem with your entire crop. But this year, very healthy grapes, um, nicely coming in. We've updated the wine. We put in some new uh, tanks already for this uh, this year's harvest. Um, and I'm you know excited by what we're able to produce in this property. My understanding is that Alvarino would normally not be too susceptible to mold because it's a pretty thick-skinned grape, correct? Yeah, it's it's a thicker skin. It's not really a mold problem, but but but, right. but but you will get you know mildew. You know is obviously going to affect the vine, affect the ability for the vine to to stay healthy, to photosynthesize, and, and be able to produce a, a, a crop. So, um, you know, mildew, mildew is, is a clear issue. And in fact, again, one of the things we did in this picture, you can see some trees in the middle of the property here, which run along the line, uh, a water line. Um, and in fact, we cleaned that water line had been slightly blocked. We cleaned that out, thinned out those trees um, in order to promote more air movement um, in the property. So making some significant um, changes in addition to this. For those of you who, um, you know, you don't have the Milagros in front of you, um, but, but um, I just wanted to sort of taste it again. It's another, it's another Alvarino. Um, I'm not going to be able to show you yeah. um, on these two, perhaps the 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 difference. Um, you know, as I look at it, um, I can see very clearly that the the Milagras um, with you know uh, this is the 2019. It's a little bit more aged, a little bit more golden in color, um, a much more uh, a much deeper nose uh, because it's spending more time. Um, on the the leaves uh, with uh, a batonnage to to you know to really help give it that depth and 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 structure um, and you know we'll have a certain amount of malolactic fermentation with this one um, in barrels. So, so barrels. 
Yeah, oh, so we'll barrel age this. We'll probably do it in um, some. We do it in five hundred liter um, uh, oak. And the production of something like this, I mean, on the grass, uh, you would probably get a production of around seventy thousand bottles a year. On the Milagros two thousand nineteen, this would be somewhere in the region of about eighteen to twenty thousand bottles. So a smaller production of these matured, um, many of these slightly matured. Arborings. Matured arborings are, are, are particularly popular in a number of markets. So a, a lot of the, uh, you know, Japan, uh, Korea, markets like that, um, hugely uh, in favor of the um, matured arborings, particularly as they go very, very well with uh, sushi. So, um, you know, for those of you who might be um, in that in that restaurant environment, you're looking for your aged arborings um, could be could be something. Um, that, that you'd want to do. And again, retail on, on this one, the 2019, about $28 retail compared to the retail on the grass, of, which was 17. I thought it was interesting, beside the, the five pips being just a fun fact, is the fact that that combined with a thicker skin means there's less room for pulp. So that makes the Alvarino grape a little bit more intense. And you can definitely taste that in both of these wines, the intensity of the of the fruit. Is beautiful. It's got a creamy texture to it. Yeah, good creamy richness. Um, nice length as well. I mean, I'm getting, I'm writing a really good length on it. Obviously, I'm with the 2019 getting a much more intense nose, a much richer nose, and I'm getting, um, you know, the, because of that time on the leaves, you just got a lot more complexity. Whereas, obviously, on the on the grass, the Pedra, you know, it's just fresh and clean and and nice acidity. Um, and on the on the Malagras. You know, just a little bit more depth, a little bit more roundness um, in it. Um, still very clean. And remember, we're partly achieving that through density of planting. So um, by planting in a in a um, you know a higher density, we're able also to to get you know the the higher skin to pulp ratio. And we'll see that also when we get down into uh, look at the wines from uh, Calcario and Principal. Uh, that is also an issue that we have there. Uh, or an, a benefit that we have there. I don't know. Should we move on to the the next wine, or what do we think? Because I think so. But I just taste. any questions. I want to say that this, um, especially the Milagres, has got some um, aromatics and flavors that remind me of a good aged German Riesling, even more yeah. so than say a Spanish Alber Alberino. Yeah, I think I think that's right. I think I think that you um, you can ex definitely expect with. Uh, with the Arborino grape, particularly when it's aged, to get more of that, you know, good uh, Riesling notes. The Lareiro, um grape variety, which we make two from um, Lareiro, one is called uh, Pas um, Royal Palmeira, and the other is Eminencia. We're not yet mm -hmm. bringing those into the United States, but that's the Lareiro grape variety. And what you get with the Eminencia, which our current release is the 2015, um, and some you might have to come to Portugal to actually taste that, but um, that's like a, a white burgundy. So you've got this Lareira grape as aged becomes much more like a, a white burgundy. The Alvarino aged becomes much more of that sort of weaseling with those more aromatics, um, you know, nice, nice, you know, nice and clean, but good depth. I mean, it's it's very distinctly different, I guess, in the sense of um, I'm an aged uh, uh, an aged riesling, but nonetheless, as you say, um, you know, real sort of uh, lovely, lovely fruits and aromatics on this. Beautiful. Um, what I'm going to try and do, whoops, no, let's just move that. No. I think as we move, yeah, so <laughs> there we are. Lots of, uh, we didn't talk about the soil. So this is granite. Um, so again, um, you know, a, a, a important, and that's also going to be helping with your, with your density of planting is also going to force the vine to push a little bit deeper to get to, yeah. Um, to get down into fine water and therefore it's going to push deeper to, to bring out some of that minerality simply by uh, denser planting, forcing those vines down. Remember, this is actually dry farm. So we're, we're um, although it's a region that's relatively wet, um, it is nonetheless a dry farm property. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, some nice pictures. There we are. Yeah, hand harvested. That is the biggest challenge at the moment in all over Portugal is getting the labor um, to be able to um, 
uh, to pick. And it's been one of the big challenges here in uh, 2024. I mean, uh, not just Portugal. So well, well, yeah, sure. All over the world. Yeah, it's true. And then here is the, the winery itself. There's some pictures of it. Uh, it's what you would expect to see um, in, a, in, a, in a property like this. And that's the region. So let's just nip down to Bayrada and just... So again, thing about Bayrada, so Bayrada is... Um, you know, Bayrada is very interesting because it has a lot of the characteristics that you'd find in, in Bordeaux, particularly in the sort of Pomerol or the uh, Madoc region. Um, you will find that the uh, influence, as I say, of the influence of the sea is important, but it's also a, a region which can have uh, international grape varieties as well. So on this particular property, we've got planted um, the Trigger Nacional, because that, that actually is the Portuguese grape variety, does a, a tremendous job. Uh, but we've also got Cabernet Sauvignon and we have Merlot on, on, on this particular property. We've also planted some Chardonnay. And um, you'll get, uh, you know, you're getting you're getting sort of some 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 quite interesting international flavors. Of course, I'm reminded that um, now in Bordeaux, the Trigue Nationale has been approved to be planted in Bordeaux because it's a variety that is particularly uh, good at, at, at heat resistance. Um, so here we are in the Bayrada, 20 kilometers from the uh, ocean. Um, Fairly mild because obviously you you've always got that cool the influence of of the the ocean never gets too hot in the summer, um, never gets too cold in the winter. Very different to what we have in the Douro or indeed what you'll find in the Down, where you have a more continental climate with more extremes of heat in the summer and and colder um, winters. Um, Byrada is 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 much more temperate. Um, the great variety that you'll mostly hear about here is Baga. Uh, we don't have a lot of baga on our properties. We don't, we don't, in the baga traditionally was used to make a sparkling white wine. And this is the region where most people historically produced sparkling baga and it was served with the suckling pig. And if you were going from, from sort of Porto to Lisbon or Lisbon to Porto on the old road, at about lunchtime, you would be in and around this region and you would stop your car, get out, have a nice hearty uh, bit of suckling pig and some, some sparkling baga, and, and that would set you up for the second half of your drive. Remember, in the old days, Porto to Lisbon was an entire day's journey. Nowadays, you can, you can do it in less than three hours. So here it is. This is, um, this is the property. It's called Colinas. Uh, Colinas is the um, Portuguese word for hill. Uh, so it's Colinas to San Lorenzo, San Lorenzo being the local town. But what's important about, about this region is, is the um, fact that we've got um, tremendous uh, limestone soil. So what, let's just go down this thing here. Yeah, so... Okay, bit of de-stemming, bit of that, yeah, all on the, okay, dry farm, limestone, limestone clay soil. So that's what's really important here. And in order to, and you're looking a little bit into the winery, this is a winery that is is fully um, gravity fed. So we're bringing in the, um, the grapes, we'll chill them overnight. Um, we've actually, between last harvest and this, we've, we've produced a new, new chilled room um, and reorganized the reception area. Um, they've been throwing in some dry ice to actually keep those things chilled before they're going in, um, completely stemming them, bringing them into separate um, separate fermentations in the tanks. And there we are. So what I want to do, and I'll leave this sign up here, is to go to this wine, Calcario. Now, Calcario... Um, this is the 2012. Calcario is the Portuguese word for limestone. Now, what I wanted to do with this wine was simply sell it under the CaCO3, which is the chemical formula for limestone. Um, but everyone told me that that was a crazy thing to do and that no one would really understand it. Um, I must say, I, I was crediting our consumers with Tremendous knowledge of chemistry, and therefore they would be able to do that. But anyway, calcarium 
in Portuguese neatly um, involves C A L cal C A R I O. And so the only thing that makes the word calcario, the Portuguese for limestone, look a little bit odd is the number three beyond it. But actually, it's been pulled out in black, um, the CaCO3, which is, as I say, the chemical formula. Now, it's calcario de principal. And as I say, what makes this property extraordinary is that it's sitting on this sort of snake-like um, thing. It's about 150 um, acres in total. Uh, it used to be divided into three different properties by name. We, we, if we just look at the vineyard area, um, it's 150. Off that, we're making the red. We have some Chardonnays, and we make a sparkling wine as a we make a a a, a blanc de blanc from the Chardonnay grapes, and we also make a, a blanc de noir because we have a little bit of uh, Pinot Noir there. But today's focus is really on on the red wines, um, and we'll start with the um, with the Calcario, uh, which. Is the 2012 harvest so this is the current release okay and what you're going to immediately get from from this is is a sense of uh, being very bordeaux like um the uh the the, the soil here is, as i said is is is, well, is is limestone the density of planting across this region typically would be about four thousand vines a hectare um, we're going up to about 6,200 per hectare. So we're getting, again, rather as we were in the, in the, um, in, in the Alvarin, as we tasted, denser planting. And that obviously is helping us to produce um, essentially slightly smaller bunches. It's forcing the vine to go deeper into the soil to get to moisture because these are dry farmed. Um, and what we're getting, therefore, is a greater amount of skin compared to the pulp. And that's helping to produce concentration. What this, the 2012, would be made of, so that the, the focus on this particular property is making Principal, which is the Grand Vin. And the wine that's coming to the States is the 2013 release, although the 2012 release is still, um, is just still on sale here in, in Portugal. We released the 13 in Portugal at a press tasting about 10, 10 days or so ago. But um, the 2012 actually is made from about 50% uh, Turiga Nacional. And then um, the uh, Cabernet Sauvignon would be somewhere in the region of about 32, 33%. And the rest essentially is Merlot. From time to time, we might have a, 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 a Petit Bordeaux or something like that in the blend, but on, on this particular one, it's primarily those three. And the biggest component is the Triga Nacional, which is, is the Portuguese grape variety. Now, Pascal Chatonet, as I already mentioned him, he is the consultant winemaker on, on this particular project. And the winemaker, resident winemaker, is Stéphane Point, who's been with us for uh, on the project for over four years. Pascal has been on the project since the end of the 90s. So he first joined in 1998. So he's very much been shepherding this. And that's why when you put your nose into it, um, you're probably thinking immediately, this this, this is Bordeaux. <laughs> um, Bordeaux is Bordeaux if they allowed Turiga Nacional in Bordeaux. Oh, that's right, they do. Mm -hmm. They have authorized it. But it's, um, yeah, it's Bordeaux-like, it's Bordeaux style. Um, this particular wine, 2012, which you can taste. This is uh, retail on this $27 a bottle. So tremendous value for uh, for a wine of, of this age and complexity. And of course, what you know, what you know, uh, I love about it is 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 the wonderful um, structure that's that's in it. You've got you've got you've got nice acidity. You've got very good you know, tannins aren't aggressive here. There's nice, they're soft. There's a bit of graphite in those tannins. There's um, they're very rounded. I think it's um, you know I think it, it's a year that um, that is good. I mean all of these years, sort of twelve now, we'll go on to the thirteen, then the fourteen. Our intention is not to release them when they're twelve years old. Our intention is to really catch up. Um, and as we internationalize, that will happen uh, when this should be able to be sold at around six or seven years of age. There would be a typical sort of aging that we would, well, for the principal, we would expect probably the calcarium might be left 
uh, released a little bit earlier than that. But there's so uh, there's some catching up that's going to take place um, on this uh, on this stock. So hopefully, if you are actually tasting, um, you're getting some of that you know nice structure, the cleanness in it. Amazing for a wine that's already twelve years old. There's still some some nice fruit in it. Um, there's you know good acidity acidity I think there's a sort of you know rather nice persistent sort of flavors um, in the mouth there's a there's a good cordially as we'd say um, and uh, yeah fine fine wine from Bayrada we're not particularly looking to to try to explain to people the differences between Bayrada and Down and Duro and Alentejo because we think that many of the people who who are um, you know coming to to visit Portugal? Are kind of coming to this small country and don't necessarily understand all of the differences between it. So um, focus really here is the it's a region of Portugal, say with this um, you know limestone outcrops, very similar conditions to Bordeaux and a very Bordeaux style wine, but with this very very important grape variety, Trigo Nacional. And remember, Trigo Nacional. Um, is a great variety that's that's found in all Portuguese uh, wine regions. It's not a particularly easy grape uh, to grow, and the reason for that is that that when it when it grows, it tends to shoot outwards rather than 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 vertically. So it needs a lot more training to bring it in. It has fairly loose bunches of of small grapes, so it's not a it's not that popular with with grape farmers who are paid on weight. But in terms of the quality of what it produces, um, it's outstanding because you've got those those um, looser bunches, um, smaller berries, good skin to pulp density, um, and that's you know that's really coming out in in these wines, and that's giving us the depth that we're looking for um, in 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 this particular wine. I don't know, Lars. Have you what have you got a comment there? Has anyone got a question? I can't. I can't see the questions that are coming up, but that's okay. There were a couple of questions about the aging requirements for this wine for the Bayrada DOC. Um, does it compare with the Grand Reserva? Um, and uh, well, there's a couple. There's two other questions. Well, let's start with that one. What do, do you know? What the aging requirement is for the Bayrada DOC? So, so it, obviously, this particular wine is um, is is not sold as a, a as a reserva, so we don't have the the particular issue. So, this is just being sold um, as DOC red wine without reserva. Whereas with the um, Principal, you know, this is a this is a reserva. This is a a grand reserva. So, this this will be. Um, this will be in wood for some of the region or I think it's 24 months. Um, and what we're doing with this, with that particular wine is we're shifting um, at the moment, it's, um, it's in 225 barriques, which you can see in this picture here. We'll be moving these to 200 and that's uh, to, from 225 to 300 litre barriques. Okay, we're just buying some new wood at the moment for for this year's harvest coming in, and we're picking up at, at, at three hundred because that's going to be more useful when these when the wood cycles through at the end of sort of six or seven years. We can then be able to move that across to aging some of the tawny port, hence three hundred as opposed to two twenty five. Um, but we we would normally have it twenty four to thirty months. The, the principal twenty four to thirty months in in Barica. Um, and that would be the, the normal process. Remember, what, what we've got here is the first wine of the Principal, the second is the Calcaria. So we're making it to make the Principal. And then obviously when we're doing the final blend, you know, some of it's ending up coming from Principal down into, into Calcaria. That was a, a major observation, the fact that you you this this wine is that mature, um, but obviously you'll be speeding that release process up a little bit. Um, because otherwise, that's uh, you're holding on to significant stocks of wine if you're on twelve year old vintages. Yeah, look, I mean, it, it's something that you're selling at twenty seven retail. I mean, if you do the math on the um, on on the price of money these days, it, it's, it doesn't really make any sense. But obviously, it's one of the delights for us to board a company that's already got this depth of stock, um, and it allows us to you know to continue with the same team of people 
um, continue to develop the wines, already having uh, the opportunity to put into the market what wines with 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 proven aging capabilities is a very different process than if we were starting uh, the table wine business on our own, where you kind of got to prove yourself. Here, you can already see this is what it's going to look like. Um, here's a twelve year old wine. In future, yeah, you're going to buy this when it's when it's um, I think four to six years old, and you're going to get Principal when it's six to eight years old. That's going to be the 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 way we approach it. Thank you. There was another question about: uh, Are you growing any baga on the estate? No, we don't. We no, no we actually don't have baga on our own properties. Uh, we do have. Um, there are lots of. There's lots of baga around us, and I know that this the project's done a lot of uh, work with baga, but that's not really what we're trying to achieve here. Um, what's going to be kind of interesting is that this is the uh, region of Portugal, which which will have an impact from the high speed, the new high speed train that's being built from Lisbon to Porto that will go somewhere through this region. Nobody entirely knows where yet. And it's a region that that has lots of small holdings because, um, you know, from Napoleonic law. So, in fact, to put this um, this 150 uh, acre property together it made up originally was made up from something like 604 different parcels that have all been purchased and we will we will continue to purchase so we're always we're buying on the boundaries of, of this particular property and we'll continue to add and obviously when you when you put that jigsaw together um then you've got enough to to be able to sort of create a vineyard so it's something that's gonna uh, it, it's gonna definitely be work in progress and i think that the the, the high-speed train coming through in the next you know five to 10 years, that's also going to give a lot of opportunity to, to be able to um, consolidate some of these small holdings in order to make some some bigger vineyards. So I'm kind of excited about the opportunity for growth in, in this particular region and then the ability for us to plant more uh, Triga Nacional, more Cabernet, more Merlot, not in order to, to try to put out, uh, to try to plant bagger. If we want bagger, we can get it locally. There's lots of people making it, growing it. Can I go to the principal, the 2013? So this is the 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 sort of ground van. Adrian, uh, unless you have unless you have other slides to show, would you mind sure. taking this down so people can see you and the labels better? And I think maybe yeah, okay. Um, well, yeah, I let's, the labels. Okay, there's the labels. So we 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 did. Yeah, sorry, there was the grass to Pedro. I should have had that up a bit of while ago. And then here is the calcario. Um, and gives you the idea there. And then the principal, which is what we want to go on to, um, where in this particular case, um, it's, it's a slightly different blend from the 13 than it was to the, um, to the uh, 2012. Uh, they, I think that's it. So this is just some co-brand information there. So I'll pop that up. I'll stop sharing at this point. Come <laughs> back to your screen, perhaps. Um, and show you the 2013. So, as I say, launched um, launched about a couple of weeks ago here in Portugal. Interestingly, the, 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 the labeling on this, if you see some of the principal old wines, um, they use a lot of this different symbolism, um, which, which you know deals with sort of friendship in the heart um, uh, and, and various other points of the symbolism, uh, fraternity and so on and so forth. And in the centre here, they sort of crossed P's of the principal. This is, um, you know, this is a little less colourful than some of the older ones. This is considered one of Portugal's great wines. So if you look at the iconic wines of Portugal, you have things like Bacavelia, it comes out of the Douro. You have right. Peramanca from the um, Alentejo, and you have Principal from Bairada. So it really sits in those top three uh, iconic wines of Portugal. Um, you know, whereas you might have, you know, consider Super Tuscans, which have got sort of Bordeaux blends, but done in, in Tuscany, we could talk about Principal as being Super Portugal in the sense that you've got this um, this blend between the Triga Nacional, the Cabernet, and the Merlot, um, which does vary from year to year, 
and here in the 2013, which we think is a, you know is a sublime year, a very very classic year, very um, you know very very high quality. Um, I'm I'm certainly I'm sorry I'm aware that not everyone on the tape on the call has actually got this wine in front of them. Um, it's about 145. One four five, one hundred and forty-five dollars retail. So it is um, priced. I'm afraid it's a bit more of an iconic wine, but you know, I mean, for one hundred and forty-five, you can't really get a good uh, Napa cap these days. And here you can get something 2013 with tremendous, um, you know, structure, good acidity, rounded and soft, uh, lovely, you know, graphite tannins there. You know. Um, it's 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 quite a, a classic cab nose, I think, on this um, for me. Um, and remember, you know, we're 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 trying. We make about twenty thousand bottles a year of this particular wine. That's the typical size. In fact, on this particular two thousand thirteen, there are twenty one thousand nine hundred and thirteen bottles made. Uh, probably of which twenty one thousand will be sold. The other nine hundred and whatever will be used for tastings and um, events and activities. Beautiful. There's a nice little light note of, I, in my notes, I have smokiness, I think a little bit of uh, tobacco leaf. Yeah, look, it's it's like it's like any of the, you know, a, a really great um, bottle-aged uh, claret, is what it's called in England. But I mean, you know, you, you, you've you you've got all that, the the, 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 the cap, the Merlot is there, but I think I think that extra dimension that we get with the Trigue National really gives um, a wine with with tremendous roundness, tremendous depth, um, and and of course for anybody who's kind of used to um, drinking you know your Napa cabs or drinking your your Bordeaux, to be able to come to Portugal and find a wine that is they're going to find is very recognisable for them, um, recognisable in terms of of quality, they're probably going to find that it's it's less expensive than than and, and over delivers in quality for the price if it's 145 retail i mean i i don't know what that would be on a restaurant uh wine list but but again it's going to be able to compete with with a lot of what's coming out of um you know napa now that making its way on to 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 wine lists um and yet i think over delivering in the sense that it's a 2013 uh, a fantastic year uh here in portugal but but you know really still superbly fresh i mean you, again you can't totally see the color from from this, but I mean, uh, um, you know, a, a, a superb coloration there. If I can just spin it with a picture in the background, spin it this way. Um, yeah, you can, you know, lovely dense color, still got lots of vibrant fruit, uh, lots of structure, graphite tannins, beautiful, beautiful wine. It is gorgeous. Uh, these are definitely, to me, these are world-class wines. I've, I've always enjoyed Portuguese table wines. Um, these four really take it to a very a different level, a higher level, and they can definitely compete with uh, a lot of other categories on the wine list, so, uh, and bring value in their own way at a different scale. Yeah, and I think I think it's important to remember that, that you know, in, in um, you go back to that point about the number of Americans that are coming here to Portugal who are discovering this, people are talking about Portugal, so being able to have on the wine list something that gives them a little bit of flavor of Portugal, either because they're going to go there or because they've been and they they kind of already made that first step and, and tried a Portuguese wine and therefore are thinking, mm, yes, I quite enjoyed it. You know, where do I go from here? I think it becomes something that that, that, that really rounds out, you know, in my view, would certainly round out a, a, a wine list. And, it, you know, I'm finding it interesting that, you know, in our we have a hotel here in uh, Porto called the Yateman. Which just won a, a, a grand award from um, Wine Spectator, so one of the ninety-two restaurants in the world with the uh, Wine Spectator Grand Award, and that's because you know I think um, there's just a lot of interest around Portuguese wines um, at the moment, and so being able to offer something that is very expressive, whether it be from the north, from the Alto Minho with the Alvarinho grape with the Grasso de Pedra, or Milagres, which is an aged version, or you know, from um, Bayrada with Principal, the Grand Van, but if not the Grand Van, then obviously something like um, the Calcario 2012, which at 27 retail is probably going to find its way onto a wine list around the $50 mark, um, is probably going to be over-delivering in terms of quality. So we're super excited to be launching these in America through co-brand, 
and certainly, you know, I, a big thank you to all of you coming on on this call, Lars, for setting it up uh, and actually visiting us this last weekend to 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 be here in person. But all of you listening in, you know, a chance to 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 see a few Portuguese wines. Thank you. And Adrian, I, I would only add to everything that you've said and and been on the point with is that these wines are you don't even have to you wouldn't even have to sell them as Portuguese wines. They they have a deserved well deserved place on any wine list. Uh, regardless, they offer great value um, and they bring a lot to the table because they are Portuguese wines, but because they are great wines, they bring a lot to the table as well. So not to, I wouldn't uh, avoid talking about Portuguese wines, but these wines, you don't even have to say, oh, they're, and they're, and they're Portuguese. They're great wines. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd agree with that. And of course, you just understand having tasted these, why we were so excited to buy the company, because for, you know, after 330 years of 332 years of focus on on port, wanting to get into some table wine business, but something that was delivering at a quality that was that was expected from a Taylor Flatgate or a Fonseca, you know, that needed to be able to be up there in terms of delivery of outstanding wines that could be compared against international best of class competition. I think we've been very fortunate to find it in this portfolio of wines, and, and that makes us, you know, excited to to show them uh, and and certainly we had to bring them there to the United States. So, Lars, I am, you know, deeply indebted for this opportunity to to talk to your colleagues here at the the, the Song Journal to talk to all these dedicated wine professionals out there who who have signed up and spent the last hour listening to uh, a small talk on Portuguese wine. Of course, we'd love all of you. Uh, to join us here in Portugal, see for yourself. Uh, but if not, um, certainly uh, through Cobrand and its distributor network, you will be able to get these wines, all of these wines there in the United States. So thank you very much, everybody, for, for tuning in this evening. And thank you particularly for Lars for your hosting and your guidance on this particular call. Thank you very much, Adrian. And just to remind everybody that this uh, recording of this webinar will be on the Psalm Journal website, as well as Facebook Live platform. And uh, there will be a little recap of it as well in uh, in an upcoming issue. I don't want to commit to which one it's going to be, but because uh, I have to write it. So it could be December, it could be uh, it could be February, but uh, you will see our, our recap of it. And uh, you can always, as I said, see this webinar again online. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thank great you, day, everyone. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye now.